grapevine.org or our mobile app. As we continue in the season of Lent, I want to encourage you to make plans now to participate in our Holy Week and Easter activities. Monday, April 11th, and Wednesday, April 13th through Friday, April 15th, join us at 12 noon in the sanctuary for our new concert series on organ and piano with guest artists Bradley Welch, Ken Surley, Scott Ayers, and our very own Linda Love. April 14th, we will have a Holy Thursday Seder service at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, remembering Christ's Last Supper with his disciples. Good Friday, April 15th, there will be a 10 Embrace service at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, focusing on the passion and crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. Then, come worship the risen Christ Easter Sunday morning during one of the following services of worship and praise. Our sunrise service at 7.30 and our contemporary worship at 11 will both be in the beautiful Grapevine Botanical Gardens just west of the church campus. Bring your own lawn chair for an outdoor celebration in the beauty of springtime. Triumphant traditional worship will convene at 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. And at 9.30 a.m., our new Family First service for parents and children will begin in Founders Chapel. Plan now for a fun, moving, and uplifting culmination of the Lenten season during Holy Week and Easter right here at First Grade Fund.
Good morning. And thank you, Orchestra, for starting us off in worship this morning. We're glad that you're here today. Whether you're watching online, you're in person, you're here for the first time or the hundredth time, we're glad that you came to worship with us and believe that we're a little more complete as a body of Christ. I'll remind you, you might already know this, we have a blood drive going on today in the Family Life Center over there, and we have a few more spots open, right, Miriam? We've got a few more spots open. And today, Carter Blood Care, for every person who donates blood, uh, they're donating $15 to help refugees from Ukraine. So what a win-win you get, yeah. So if you feel called to do that, you can ask someone where, how to get there or you can find me and we'll just take a parade down there today. Speaking of parades, happy Palm Sunday, Hosanna in the highest. We're, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, we're grateful for your presence with us today as we remember Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. It's our prayer that as we move through worship that you might stir our hearts so that we can go out and be the people you've called us to be to a world in need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope as you came in this morning you received a palm. So as we sing our opening hymn, I invite you to stand and wave your palm as we sing. And as you do so, we will have an actual children's, uh, children's procession. So let's, let's stand and sing and celebrate. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated.
Uh, the children, we thank, thank the children for singing. Isn't it great? I just love having them here uh, coming down the aisle with their palm branches. This feels so good on Palm Sunday to have the children be part of our time together. They're heading over to the 11 o'clock contemporary service to sing over there right now. So they're singing twice. Two different worship services happening at the same time in our church. We're grateful to be able to gather together. I believe we have a video right now for, first, for family first worship, a new service we're starting next Sunday on Easter. If we're ready to do that. We can show that now, kind of proclaiming a new thing happening. Hi, I'm Dan. This is my family, the Davises. This is Kristen, Katie, and Drew. And we're really excited about the new uh, Family First Service. So the whole idea of the Family First Service is to bring families uh, and have them spend time together. Uh, a lot of times when you come to church, you find that uh, as soon as you get here, you're, you're off to different Sunday school classes, uh, often learning different material. So th here's an opportunity for you to spend time and grow as a family together, uh, worshiping together in one place. Uh, we expect a certain level of chaos uh, with this service, knowing that uh, we're going to have families and people of all ages. Uh, we have planned activities that are going to drive a lot of fun into the service. So we're really excited to get started. Uh, we hope to see you on Easter. And we are very excited about that, to reach new people in that way, and also folks a long time, part of our church family, gathering together in that unique way, just families gathering to worship in that new time. And if you don't know it, uh, you reach new people with new things, so we're doing that. Uh, and we also celebrate this time together right now, and we are not met, I'm Pastor Mike Ramsdale, Pastor Mike, and I tell folks that if they're older than me, they can call me Mike, younger than me, they can call me Pastor Mike, you decide who you are. And so that's kind of how that works. We're going to pray in a moment, pastoral prayer. Receive an offering. We simply give as, G as we have received. That's what Jesus taught. Following that, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together in a song. So when that time comes, prepare, and will you be led in that song as you sing it? They'll, uh, the choir will begin. You kind of follow. It's a way of singing uh, and praise on Palm Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being generous with us. Overflowing grace, beautiful day. Blessings in our lives, God, that we cannot count. We receive, God, from you all our life. We received even today, and now we choose to give back to you in our offering. Be blessed, God, by the generous hearts of your people. As you're blessed by your generous heart toward us. Also hear our prayers, God. We ongoing each day are concerned about a war in our world in Ukraine and people damaged by that. Somehow, God, bring peace. A place where it seems not possible. Let God bring peace. We can help and serve in that way in any way Show us how, when, and where we might be able to do that. We're mindful, God, of people around us today in church and those in our families and community, God, who need you as well. There are so many, God, about an illness or our grief and loss, other concerns of life, other needs, maybe even depression or sorrow, heartbreak. We pray, God, somehow in this Palm Sunday season, they'll, they'll find the joy and hope, God, that you offer. Maybe this worship right now. Maybe other times as they mark this week and coming up toward Easter. So here I pray, God, for all those around us, all those in our world, in our communities and our families. And that prayer is prayed in Jesus' name. Jesus, we taught us to pray this prayer we pray now in song. Our Father. Those who sin 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Son and Holy 
invite you to remain standing as we continue our worship with our hymn of preparation, a great old hymn of the church, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear Things I would ask him to tell me If he were here Seeds by the wayside Tales of the sea Stories of Jesus Let me hear how the children stood round his knee, and I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace, all in the love light. Into the city I follow the children's band, waving a branch of the palm tree high in my hand. One of his heralds, yes, I would see. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith before God and one another with these words. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our scripture this week takes place right after Jesus has entered Jerusalem in a triumphant way on a donkey, and he is gathered with his disciples in a room there to share the Passover meal. Uh, and as they're gathered around the table, Jesus does something completely unexpected, something completely unusual. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes his disciples' feet. Peter jumps up and says, no, Lord, shouldn't I wash your feet? Jesus says, no, I don't wash you. You don't have a part of me. Jesus also said, not only after he showed us who he is and, and his purpose for coming to this earth, he said to his disciples, you must wash one another's feet. This is how you must care for one another. And thus telling us something about who he is, why he came, and who he is calling each and every one of us to be. As we encounter Jesus this week, showing us how to be servant leaders, we are called into the story to go and to serve and encounter those that God has put in our way. A couple things this morning. Uh, first, uh, we celebrate those who worship with us online and certainly in person. Uh, just so you'll know, uh, this time with the kids, of course, is highly amazing and wonderful to see them up here singing and Palm Sunday and waving their palm branches. It feels like church, doesn't it, when kids are joining us today? Already had a report. We may have had the most kids involved in church uh, in worship services as well as the Sunday school we've had in, a, in several years. So we're so pleased to think about all the kids running around. Yesterday we had a time with an Easter bunny and had a breakfast and I gave them resurrection eggs at the end. There was a, a lot of people, a lot of kids uh, gathering with families and moms and dads, grandparents, pastors, uh, children's workers gathering together yesterday. See them running around outside, inside. It just felt really good to see all that. So we also did something new. Uh, we've had a small number of chairs in our chapel for a long time. We like to get make people stick closer together, and so we removed chairs. We put them back for today. And so we have filled that place up with chairs once again that we can fill it up this Sunday and next Sunday and beyond. So we feel like God's really leading us in the right direction where we celebrate that. I wanted you to feel good. I feel good about it. Carly, you feel good about it? Jason, you feel good about it? I want you to feel good about it too. We're going in a really good direction. I celebrate that. Thank you for being here today. And I've talked about that enough, but I wanted to do it. Now, too many times the last couple of years, we got up here and shared bad news. So let's share some good news today. And that's what that is. Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphant entry, we call it, into Jerusalem. We're going to talk about a story that happened that week here in this Encounters with Jesus message series. It happened on Holy Thursday, we call it now. It's Passover night. There they shared that Passover meal, and there was some stuff went on that was kind of unusual. Uh, you saw that in the video. I'm going to read the scripture verses that speak to that here in a little bit. Uh, Good Friday happens this week and happened then. That's where Christ died on the cross and Easter happens. That's coming. Uh, it's a very important, meaningful week. When Jesus entered Jerusalem that Sunday, that time for that entry, it was a very unique time because Jesus a short time before had been in Bethany and there Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And everybody Everywhere in Jerusalem is talking about this Jesus who they'd heard about. Now they heard he raises the dead too. Nobody argued that he had done it. So they were all out there waiting for this special, he's coming now and he's got, he, ha, he must be the Messiah. He's going to save us. And so they would shout, Hosanna, 
Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us right now. We are ready. We're tired of the Roman occupation, poverty, uh, hunger, uh, religious oppression. We don't want any more of this. Save us now. And so they threw these things in the street, which was palm branches and some of their clothing, their cloaks. What they would do is they would completely cover the street. There wouldn't be one bit of dirt that this king would come in and he would walk on uh, the clothing and, and not the dirt, walk on the palm branches, not the dirt, because that's how kings enter cities. So they were helping. We can't do much else, but we can do this. That's what they did. So that's the story that lays a foundation for his entry and then this Passover time where these events happen, where he washed his disciples' feet, where he knelt down, uh, he put a, a towel over his arm, he got a basin full of water, and he put his disciples' feet there, and he washed those feet there, kneeling before them in that amazing place. In response to that, here is what he says to help you and I understand what is really going on. Verse 12 through verse 17, chapter 13, encounters with Jesus in the Gospel of John, hear this word. He begins with this, do, do you understand what I have done for you? When he had finished washing in their feet, he put his on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? We want to be able to answer the question Jesus is asking us. And he asked them, do we understand what it means that Jesus washed his disciples' feet, or do we miss it? If we miss it, we miss Jesus. If we miss it, we don't know who Jesus is. If we miss it, we don't know who we're supposed to be. If we miss it, we don't understand, that we don't understand one thing. If we miss that the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord, the rabbi, he goes on to say, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. That's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you as an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you that no servant is greater than the master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, now that you know it, now that you've seen it, now that you've experienced it, now that you're part of it, You'll be blessed if you do them. And there is that story that lays the foundation for the message and this day and all of Christianity, all of living out life as a Christian, all about Palm Sunday and Holy Week and, you know, saying, I, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you. I'll tell you about the, the best worship service I was ever part of. Been part of many. Service today is, is great. The music has been amazing. Thank you, choir, for sharing today. The kids singing. Have, we, we did everything we could possibly do to make it a great day, you know, and all over campus that's happening. And so I've been to many great worship services, been a part of them, participated, preached them. I preached to thousands and thousands of people at one time, my ministry. But my greatest worship service wasn't one of those. It wasn't one of those big days where the walls were, you know, crowded and all that. It was this. I, I was in Zimbabwe. And there in that small, village, that small school we provided food for, our church did, as well as uh, uh, there for a triage and a medical care with what we're doing, and people lined up for the medical help. And after we ran out of all the medications, all we had left was vitamins. They were lined down the dusty street by that school in a desert area just for one vitamin, just that one thing. We said, that's all we got. didn't matter. They wanted it. That's kind of poverty they experienced there in that part of the world. Came time for me to just kind of wander around for a while, had a little break, and so I went over to what was a very small church that was on the campus of that very small uh, school orphanage kind of experience. Uh, and they had no windows, no doors. The, 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 floor, the, the seats, the pews were logs, not even hewn logs, just kind of sticks of stuff on them, just whatever you could sit on. Uh, the pulpit was handmade. It was nothing impressive at all. The floor was dirt, and it was mud brick. And he was hoping one day they could get windows. That was his dream. One day we like to have windows here so when it's cold or it's hot, we can have a little better experience here. And that's what Pastor Kenneth told me in his broken English. Share that with me. We walked over there, just yeah, he and I, and he wanted to show me his church. 
You know, I'm gonna look at this and this and this and this and this. And, you know, again, pretty pitiful building, nothing to brag about, but it was his church and he was proud of it. As we're in there, people start coming in. One comes in, then two, then three, then five, then ten. And after a while, uh, it's full of people sitting and all around us. And I said, oh, Pastor Kenneth, I'll leave now. You must be getting ready to have a worship service. He said, oh, no, no. Well, then why are they here? They're, they're coming because they saw you come in. And they know you're a pastor. A little cross and flame on my little jacket I was wearing. And they're here for you to bless them. And I asked, what, what, are the, what are they looking for? He looked at me like, are you a dummy? They're here for you to bless them. And so I began blessing them one after the other. No, no language connection, just simply praying, God, bless this person, heal them, help them, give them grace, just bless them. And that went on for a long time. And, and I will tell you, that's the most memorable worship service I've ever been a part of. Now think about Christianity in the light of that kind of story. Christianity in the light of the Son of God, the, the King of the universe, the one who through which the world was created, the Messiah, the sent one, the one that just a moment ago came in the city and they shouted, Save us now, you're the king, and they worship him, kneeling and washing their feet. What an amazing story that that is, because in many ways he turned every order of understanding of anyone upside down because it made no sense, and they didn't get it at all, by the way. They entered this place already arguing before the service even started, arguing who's going to sit in the right hand, who's going to sit in the left hand when the kingdom comes. A mom got involved in this one because she thought her sons, James and John, ought to be sitting at the right hand, the left hand, and the others heard about that conversation, and they were mad at James and John and his mother and each other. We should all, who, we should all get a chance to be at a high level with his Jesus here, and, and that's what they argued about. And when, he was told, when they were told, go in the city and you'll find a donkey for me to ride, they're thinking, what's with the donkey business? Kings don't ride donkeys. They don't come into a, a, a city they're going to lead into a victory against the Romans on a donkey where you come on white horses or, or you come in a chariot, but not a donkey. What's with the donkey business? And, and, and here he comes. And, and they already were not figuring out, what the heck is this when he gets out? And when they're waiting for him to, to set them free from the Romans, he kneels at their feet instead. When they, when they wait for Jesus to, to fix everything and make it right, instead, he's going to be crucified in just a couple, just a day or so and die on the cross for the sins of the world. That's what he's going to do. That's how he's going to live. Think about the identity Jesus has, influences us to live into, and how we might view identity, who I am, who we are ourselves. When I was uh, around 20 years old, uh, I, had not, I had yet to meet Rhonda, and I was in the Navy at the time. I decided I needed to have some, more, some nicer civilian clothes. Get ready to go to Key West, so I, I bought some civilian clothes. And so I went in my 20-year-old brain. Uh, it was 1973, 74, so please take that into account. And I purchased some green plaid bell-bottom pants uh, with the cuff. They had the cuff. That was right when platform shoes started coming out. And so I bought some of those too. Anybody else here have those besides me? I'm sorry. You didn't need platform shoes. And I didn't need platform shoes either, but I, I was very tall when I wore those shoes. I had a, a yellow turtleneck light sweater that I wore. And a, don't laugh. I'm laughing at myself. A beige corduroy jacket. Now, I was set. I flew in an airplane dressed like that. You know, I knew everybody was thinking, man, man, he's cool, he's cool. That's what I thought. Uh, now, Rhonda saw me, my wife Rhonda saw me wear that a time or two before we started dating. And, and I said, what do you think? What, I asked her just yesterday, I think it was, what do you think of that, that outfit I was wearing? She said, well, it, it was okay. It was okay. Uh, that was her, but... 
that was my identity. That's, that's kind of how I understood myself. That, that was a different way of looking at who Mike Ramsdale was. Now, please think about what Jesus said. Do you understand why I have done this for you? He went and got a motorcycle and got the jacket and got the boots and, you know, got everything set up and got the helmet. And I, I took a picture and put it on Facebook. And my sister, my, my baby sister, sent me a note saying, you know, with that helmet, you look like a dork. I said, thank you, thank you. That's not how I understood myself. I saw something quite different than my sister saw when she looked at me. What do people see when they see us? What do we see when we see ourselves? It starts with how I see myself. You know, it took a while for the disciples to finally get They would get it after the cross, after the resurrection, after Pentecost, when they went into the world sharing the good news with everyone, all people. They, they finally got at least some level, but do, do we get it? Do you get it? Have I got it in that, that very best, best moment where I said it was the best worship service? How about the best choir anthem I've ever heard? And the choir today was great. They're great. So maybe it's one and two, two and one. I won't. I don't want to rate one over the other. Uh, this also was in Africa, where we spent all that time. I've talked about already serving this, and most of the kids told this before, but for if you haven't heard it, I, I want to tell it again today. Uh, and most of the kids in that particular school had AIDS, uh, which meant in that culture, none lived to adulthood. There was no medication. There was no way they could get it, no way they could afford it. They were going to die before they were adults. And they had a break, and so I go sit on a little curb there by a uh, sidewalk, just taking a break, resting. It's been a busy, uh, tiring, exhausting time. And three little girls see me. I'm guessing about five years old, and they wear little blue dresses. You wear blue dresses at a lot of the schools in Africa. And they had the little blue dresses they came up in, and they came up, again, not a word of English. Uh, not, not, uh, uh, we couldn't communicate. I get to sit there, and here they are smiling, standing right in front of me. I'm by myself, again, with my cross and flame on. I'm the pastor. They see that. That's important, and people care about that in Africa. You know, a little different sometime than here, but they care about that in Africa. And, and they stop, and they look at me, and they go, together in unison, and twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And they sang the whole little song. Only English words they knew. Best choir anthem I've ever heard. Think about what this means when it says, do you understand this, Jesus says. Do you, under, do you get what I have done for you? That the king and the Lord and the master and the rabbi wash your feet. In that culture, that would never happen. That was so out of order, it was in your face. Someone would do this. That's why Peter says, no, no, not me. You can't. That's all wrong, Jesus. You've got it all wrong. We wash your feet. And he tells Peter, in other words, you've got it wrong. If I can't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. He said, well, wash my feet and, and wash my head too. You know, as he began, maybe there's something here I need to hear and receive about. Do you, do you understand this? Do you understand what the identity is? We search as human beings a lot for identity. We search for significance. We search for some way people around us say, hey, they've done it. They've got it. They accomplished it. They have, this is who they are. And Jesus says it's not about that at all. That's why he says things like the first shall be last, the last Shall be first. Are you going to bring in the kingdom now? They asked. Can I sit on your right and my brother on your left? What's with the donkey you came in on? Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. He kneels and washes his disciples' feet. What an amazing story. One of the best Christmas worship services I ever had was this. And I've had a lot of those, the candles, the whole works, you know, I love that. We, we enjoy that. We always go. Just that's a part of our Christmas season. But this is different. I was asked to go to a homeless shelter, an outdoor homeless shelter uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, they're in the Lancaster area where a lot of homeless people live. And do, do you preach the Christmas story there. That's your job to do that. Oh, by the way, while you're there, we need you to do a funeral too. Uh, we've lost one of our long-term homeless people here. His name is Smiley. Smiley looked 80. He was probably 60, and he had died. And everybody loved Smiley because he smiled a lot. 
He didn't say much, but he smiled all the time. Very friendly, happy guy. And so we want you to tell the Christmas story to all the folks that are here. Serve them communion somewhere in this time frame. And we want you to do Smiley's funeral. I, had no, I, I didn't know Smiley, his story. I'd seen him, but didn't know his story, his life, ups and downs, his sins, his success. I knew nothing about Smiley. All I knew was God's about kneeling at our feet. God's about grace. God's about forgiveness. God's about granting us everlasting life. That's what God's about. I, I understood that because I had experienced that in my own life. You probably have too. And so I was able to simply stand there and celebrate smile, all of Smiley's life, all those people who connected to him, those who grieved his loss there at that homeless place, and the fact he had been given by God everlasting life. One of my very best Christmas services was that this act, this in your face, turning everything upside down, this the going from the way it's supposed to be to the way it's supposed to be, the way it's always been to the way God wants it to be, and the dramatic shift was so tremendous that it just amazed everyone. This would be a, a part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, we thought it all. It's so different. This is who Jesus is. This is who he is. When you pray to God in Jesus' name, this is who he is. This is who the Messiah is. This is who, who we follow. This is who we are called to be as his disciples. It's an understanding of what it is to be a Christian who experiences this kind of grace from him to us undeserved and simply gives it back. All kinds of ways, forgiveness and love and grace and occasionally doing a funeral at a homeless shelter for me. Or hearing three little girls sing the entire chorus of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Or blessing people who can't speak the language I speak. I don't know why they're there, but I do the best I can. Blessing everybody, all that, all that. And the story of how we change and know who we are and who God calls us to be. It's called being delivered, and that's the word. Jesus, when he knelt at their feet, was delivering them from everything. All their wrong suppositions about world and life and God and the kingdom and the law, all the things they understood or thought they understood, all the things about their culture, society, religion. He, he delivered them from all those things and says, do you understand what I've done for you? They didn't, but they would. They would after the cross. We don't understand it now. We will on Easter, won't we? We'll figure it out then what we're talking about here. And I'm going to tell you about the, the best Mother's Day moment that I had. And that was uh, an event uh, also in Fort Worth. And there were uh, many women who, uh, in that part, there was a community there, women who had been abused, typically by men, and married sometime. Uh, they were certainly involved in, a, in a spousal abuse and were now isolated, uh, living away from family, often hiding from those who might be coming after them, lived in fear, typically in poverty, some were on the streets, some were not, and they gathered together under a big, big tent that was put up out there. And underneath that tent, uh, there were tables with real tablecloths on them. On the tables, uh, there was crystal, there was china, there was silverware, there was all kinds of things laid out there. And then they asked me and the men who were with me uh, to put on a tuxedo. We all went into bathrooms and put tuxedos on they had for us, put that tuxedo on, put towels on our arms, and went out there, and we served them the food. These women that had been abused typically by men, damaged by marriage, damaged by those who'd hurt them, taken advantage of them, done everything you can imagine to them, had these men all dressed up wearing tuxedos, serving them their food, giving them drinks, waiting on them hand and foot, and serving them. Now, that was a great Mother's Day. Now, do you understand, he said, do you understand what I have done for you? It delivers us to be Christians. We are saved by the blood of Christ, but we choose to live as Christians. Do you understand, he said, why and what I have done for you? Pray with me, please. 
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day that Jesus did exactly what he did and still today does what we need him to do for us. Sometimes, God, we don't understand or we forget what we once knew, what it is to be a Christian. But today, God, we hear that and we'll hear it more fully on Holy Thursday worship, our Passover shared. We'll hear more fully on Good Friday. We mark the cross of Jesus Christ. I said it more fully on Easter when the tomb is empty, we celebrate. Each day and when the organ plays and we just come and worship and meditate and turn towards you and think about how maybe a, a gift might help those in Ukraine or suffering today in ways that we can't imagine. So we celebrate God, trying to understand what you say to us and doing so how you might deliver us and set us free to be Christians. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. After Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, now you go and wash each other's feet. So as we enter our time of invitation before we sing our last hymn, I invite you to consider how you might respond to Jesus serving you. Maybe that's signing up to greet next Sunday when we'll have so many guests in our building. Maybe it's signing up to give blood today or something else, but it don't leave here unchanged after Jesus has uh, cared for us. Let's go care for others. Will you stand as we sing our last hymn?
thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you are new and you, you want to learn more about our church, want to become a member, there's a booth uh, in the foyer that says new here. We'd love to meet you there. There's a volunteer that will uh, help you and get connected in whatever way you like. Uh, as we go through this holy week, this week with eight days, it's our prayer that you would participate as we go through from Palm Sunday to Easter, that you would uh, participate in the transformation of death to life as well. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.